And I give you this. Uh, every teaching of the Bible has to have a good timeline. Right? Now, this is not dispensational charts. Right? This is a nice timeline that gives you the summary of the Bible. And this is your page 10. Right? So your page 10 gives you, I think, a nice summary of um, how... Uh, a timeline here, so you have that on your, your sheets. The, the, first, the first one is, is Old Testament, right? So if you were to say, what is the timeline of the Bible, right? It's linear, right? It is, starts in creation, right? Assumes the fall, right? And as the prophets look forward, they look forward to a kind of halfway point of history, right? They look forward to... A future age, and that's what I, you know, is simply called the age to come, right? Or the last days, right? They look forward to the future days, the last days. That's how the prophets look to the future. And they look to the future, and I give you a whole package there that they're looking forward to in prophetic anticipation. When the future age comes, the new creation will come. Isaiah 65. When the new, when the new age comes, the new covenant will come. The new temple will come. The new exodus will come. The spirit will be poured out. Judgment will take place. Salvation, the king will come. The kingdom will come. And the king will come. Right? And who will bring that age? Well, it's the Lord and the king. Right? It's the father and the son who will bring that age. Then the son is the one who will have the spirit. Right? So there's the prophets. As they look to the future... The Lord will save. The Lord will keep his promises all the way back to Genesis 3 feet by the provision of a seed of the woman who will bring the rule and reign of God to this earth, right? He will bring ultimately salvation, judgment, new creation, new heavens. I mean, all of that will take place, right? New Testament says exactly the same thing. Yet it modifies the timeline in terms of an overlap of the ages. Right? And this is important. So you have creation, you have fall, you have now first coming and second coming. Right? And then you have an overlap of the ages. The top line here is age to come. Right? So it's the same outlook of the prophets. So they, I don't think, there's lots of dispute on this, it's into eschatology and so on. I don't think the prophets were thinking of first and second coming of, of the Messiah. Right? Why do I say that? Well, John the Baptist didn't seem to think that. Right? Uh, the disciples, right? They're not thinking of a suffering Messiah. They're not thinking of one who must die and be raised and then come again. Right? Uh, that is a really a New Testament revelation as to um, uh, you know, something that will, will occur. Right? Yet, right, uh, the same package of age to come will arrive in the first coming of Christ. And this is known as the already. And then also you have the second coming, which is the consummation of the not yet. Right? So this is the famous already not yet tension. Right? And Christ is the one, right? So the Lord and the King, right? which is now identified with Jesus, is the one who brings this age to come into the world. And he will then consummate it at his coming. And this whole intervening period here is the last days, right? So you and I live in the last days between the first coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ. But it's now God's future age has come, right? So in the coming of Christ, the new creation is here, right? It's here in terms of us. We are new creations and the church is a new creation. The new covenant is here. Right? The forgiveness of sins is here. Our justification is here. Yet we still await the fullness of the end. Our adoption is here, but we still await the fullness of the adoption. Right? So this is how the New Testament lays out right, the timeline of Scripture. This is eschatology. But notice at the center of this, right? who is it that brings this age to come? Right? This age uh, in terms of uh, who brings it? Ultimately, it's right? Christ who brings it, right? The Lord and the King. But this gives us, right, not only the timeline of the Bible, but this gives us the highest Christology imaginable. Why is that? Because in biblical thought, the only person that can bring God's rule to this world, the age to come, the new creation, the forgiveness of sins, 
is ultimately God himself. Right? So that here you have, right? Yes, he will be human. But this Son of God is so identified with God that you begin to wonder if he's God. And of course, one of the great Psalms that picks this up, that's quoted the most in the New Testament, is what? Which Psalm? The most quoted Psalm in the New Testament. 110, right? Psalm 110, right? So Psalm 110, this is the Psalm that Jesus picks up in conflict with the religious leaders in Matthew 22, right? Jesus says to the religious leaders, hey, who is the Messiah? And they rightly answer, David's son. But then Jesus follows up and says, okay, but why, quoting Psalm 110, does David call him Lord? Now, what Jesus is doing, and of course, they have no answer for him. They say, oh, we don't want to talk to you anymore. Right? But what's doing, right, he's quoting Psalm 110, and Psalm 110 is a, is a glorious psalm, but it's embedded in the Psalter, which already is giving you hints of this Davidic king who is so identified with Yahweh that you begin, he begins to take on the very role and the works and, and the names of Yahweh, right? But here you have the Lord, which is the name for Jehovah, Yahweh, says to my Lord, and remember, it's David who's speaking. David knows from the Davidic promise, right? Because God says to him, you're going to die with your fathers. I will raise up your offspring. He knows he's not the Messiah. But from David's line will come the one who will rule the world. And so he says here, the Lord says to my Lord, and of course this next finishing of verse 1 is, has to be placed within biblical thought, right? Not pagan thought, right? Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. In biblical thought, no angel, no mere human shares the throne of God. You have here now David saying, the Lord says to my Lord, my son, the one who's coming from me who will ultimately be my Lord, that this son will sit at your right hand, right? To sit at the right hand of God is to have equal authority, equal power, equal rule, right? He is Lord, right? And he then speaks of him in those terms, and then it speaks of the Lord will extend this king's mighty scepter from Zion. He will rule. Uh, he's also identified with a priest in the order of Melchizedek, which is also very, very important as well. And the Lord of verse 6 is at your right hand. He will crush kings. So clearly this king is human. right? He will crush kings. He'll come to this world and so on and so on and so on. Yet, right? you look at this, and this is why Jesus asked the religious leaders, who is the Messiah? Oh yes, he's David's son. We all got that. But why is he presented in Psalm 110, but also in the entire prophets, as the one who will sit at the right hand of God, the one who will bring the new creation, the one who will bring a new covenant, the one who will bring the forgiveness of sins? All of those acts are acts of God alone. Right? Moses doesn't bring the new creation. He can't even get into the promised land. Right? David doesn't bring anything. He ends up dead. Solomon crashes and burns. Right? I mean, none of these people bring anything, right? These heroes of the Old Testament are absolute disasters for the most part. Right? So the promise here is of a son of God who will eclipse any human. He will be human, though, right? I mean, you've got to go all the way back to Genesis 3:15. The seed of the woman. He'll come from the human race. Yet, he is from eternity. He is the one who is, and of course the New Testament makes this very clear. John 1, right? This son has always, always been. This son has always, always been in relation to the Father. This son is the one who became flesh. 
The Son in His becoming flesh is the one who fulfilled all of the point of, of the Old Testament, the types and the structures and the promises and so on and so on and so on. And that's why the, the, on page 10, as we finish this here, the Christocentric focus of the New Testament is just everywhere, right? It's not Israel that's the focus, it's Christ <laughs> that's the focus, who brings these things to pass. He is the final revelation of God, right? Hebrews 1, in the past God spoke to the prophets, in these last days all revelation has come through him. Right? I mean, that's an astounding statement, right? He is the new temple, right? Destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it, he says. He is the great high priest. He is, and we'll come back to this, he is explicitly called God in the New Testament, right? Uh, he's the focal point of history, right? Matthew 11 is just... You have to ask, who does Jesus think he is in Matthew 11, right? So Matthew 11 is the passage where John the Baptist, right, is put in prison, eventually beheaded. John the Baptist is the forerunner who's announcing the coming of Jesus, but he's stumbling, right? He's wondering, you know, he's expecting. So this is why I think the Old Testament prophets didn't think in terms of first and second coming, right? John's thinking when the Messiah comes, everything's going to come to its end. But he doesn't seem to see that, and so he says, are you really the one, right? There's some doubts that John has, and Jesus goes back and quotes Old Testament to him, right? Go back and report, verse 4, the blind receive the sight, the lame walk, those who are leprosy are cured. All of that was part of the prophets as they promised the new age, right? So he's saying, yes, I am the Messiah. What the prophets have looked forward to is here, yet John there's going to be a first coming, and there's going to be a second coming, and you don't know that, and you're not even going to see uh, the cross, and so on and so on. And then he speaks very strongly of John, right? So even though John has doubts, he's still the forerunner, he still has faith, he's, he's just trying to put the pieces together, right? And then he says in verse 11, this statement, I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there's not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Quite a statement, isn't it? Think of all the Old Testament figures, John the Baptist is the greatest of them. Greater than Moses, greater than Elijah, greater than David, greater than... And then he says, oh, seemingly in a contradictory way, yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So you have to say, well, why is John the greatest and the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than him? How does... How do we make sense of this? Well, you make sense of it because Jesus puts himself in the middle. So why is John the greatest? Because John has the supreme privilege of all the prophets of eventually saying, that's him. Isaiah couldn't do that. Isaiah could only do that 700 years earlier. Right? So he has the privilege of saying, there's the Messiah. <laughs> right? But... John never saw the cross. John never witnessed the resurrection. John, you know, didn't see the events. So that's why least, right, in least in the kingdom of heaven, now live after the death of Christ, after the resurrection of Christ, after Pentecost. We now know more. We're the least, right? We know more than John ever knew, just as we know more than Moses ever knew. But notice what Jesus is doing here. He is putting himself at the center of all human history. All of the plan of God. Because that's what he says here. He says in verse 12, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven is advancing. Right? And then he says in verse 13, For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Right? Jesus is basically saying, and this is why it's an outrageous statement, right? I'm the most significant figure of all of human history. John is so great because he introduced me. Everything is turned in on Jesus, right? You are even better than John because you know me more than he did, right? Everything is centered on him, right? He views himself as the focal point of all of God's plans, all of God's promises, all of God's purposes. He's the one who's brought the rule and reign of God to this world. He is the one who is the Lord, and of course, in his work, he brings salvation, he brings the promises to pass, and he will then bring a new world, right? In some sense, the last uh, vision, one of the last visions of, of the book of, of Revelation, right? Give us, in some sense, Revelation 4 and 5, give us, in some sense, the storyline of the scripture in visionary form, 
right? And uh, Revelation 4 and 5 is, is one of these last wonderful texts, and we'll finish with this, and we finish this section here, right? Revelation 4 and 5, right, uh, is crucial in the book where John is called up into heaven and all the book of Revelation now unfolds, right? But in chapter 4, we are told that as John comes into heaven, he sees God, right? Now, he doesn't see him in the sense of you know, there's a physical being there, right? Because even the description of him is, you know, he sees a throne and then he sees appearance of gemstones and he sees 24 other thrones. I mean, it's typical of, of descriptions of God in the scripture. You don't really describe God. He's not so big, so tall, and so on, right? It's always describing what's around the throne, right? And it's a majestic presentation of God, right? Uh, so he has 24 thrones around him, four living creatures. They sing uh, day and night, holy, holy, holy. Uh, they worship. I mean, this is awesome presentation of God and his lordship, his sovereignty, his holiness, his glory, and so on. And then you have in verse 11, you are worthy our Lord and God, to receive glory, honor, power for you created all things by your will. So here's the song of creation, right? God, you are the Lord, right? You're the sovereign one. And then you have in chapter 5, a drama unfold before your eyes, right? It's all one vision, right? Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides, sealed with seven seals, right? So in the hand, the right hand, right, speaks of authority, right? In the right hand, who sits in the throne, this God who is unapproachable, this God whom all these elders are worshiping day and night, in that hand is this scroll, and it has writing on both sides, it's sealed with seven seals. Now, you never usually wrote on both sides of a scroll, right, because... You had papyri that uh, were strips on the back, and it was not very good for writing. Right? So the scroll would have writing on both sides if it's very, very important, or you're too cheap to get another scroll. Right? So that's not God. Uh, so writing is very, very important, and sealed with seven seals. So it's a legal document. As you read the book of Revelation, this scroll ultimately is God's purpose for the universe, God's purpose of salvation, God's purpose of judgment. But the sealing of it means... Unless it's opened, none of God's purposes will happen, right? Salvation won't come. The defeat of death won't come. Uh, God's promises won't be realized, right? So this scroll becomes very, very, very important, right? And that's why you have in verse 2, a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud uh, voice, a challenge is issued, who is worthy to break the seal and open the scroll? Now, the worthy language has also been picked up in verse 11 of chapter 4, right? So God is worthy. And now the challenge is, who is worthy like God to bring about all of his plan? Who can bring salvation to the world? Who can bring judgment to the world? Who can bring about all of these things? Who is worthy enough? And the answer that comes in verse 3 is nobody. And then it's comprehensive. No one in heaven, earth, under the earth, right? So it tells you, right, no angel, no human, no creature, nobody, right? And that's clearly biblical thought. Like, who can bring the forgiveness of sins? No human can. Who can bring new creation? No human can. Who can bring any of these things? No human can. And John then, in verse 4, this is the, the emphasis wept and wept here is he's doing it bitterly, right? He's just totally sobbing, like a child who's just totally out of control as they're crying, right? And he's not weeping, just simply, you know, for no reason at all. He's weeping because no one can open the scroll, right? And that means for John, and it should mean for us, right, that if no one can open the scroll, we're doomed, right? There's no salvation. There's no judgment. There's no resurrection. There's no life. There's no right relation with God. Everything is gone, right? All of God's promises are for naught, but one of the elders says, right, and this all picks up Old Testament language, do not weep, the lion of the tribe of Judah, right, that's applied to Jesus alone, right, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed, right, so this is Genesis 49, this is Davidic, right, here's Messiah, he is able to open the uh, scroll and its seven seals, then I saw a lamb, looking as if been slain, standing in the center of the throne. Notice the center of the throne, right? He's not an outsider to the throne. He's the one who's in the center. He comes right from the center, right? He's God equal with the one on the throne. 
And he is Messiah, but he's also lion who's lamb, right? And mixture of imagery here, right? So he's Messiah who is also Savior. And he then comes, and his description is glorious. And he then opens the scroll. And then you have the song of redemption, right? The song of creation, you are Lord, are worthy. Now you have the song of redemption in verse 9. You are worthy, right? Who is worthy to open the scroll? Well, there's only one. And the one is presented as, right, the Lord Jesus Christ, right? He's the one, Messiah. He's more than Messiah. He is God equal with God, right? And of course, as he, the song of redemption is proclaimed, you were slain, you purchased us from every tribe, language, people, nation, all this is Abrahamic language, isn't it? You made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. They'll reign on the earth. You brought the rule of God, the reign of God through your death and so on. And then what do you have? Right? The song of heaven. Right? All of the angels. Right? They give equal praise, equal worship to the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Right? So you have equality yet distinction. You worship the Lord, but you also worship the Son, right? So as you go through the Old Testament, and that's a crowning, crowning feature, but that, in some sense, that's a summary line of Scripture, isn't it, right? As you work through the Old Testament, right, God creates us, yes, we fall. How is He going to redeem us? Salvation is of the Lord. He's going to do so by this Lamb, right, by this King, by this One who is also identified with Him, right? Like earlier on, the question of the Shema of Israel, Deuteronomy 6, right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, right? The language of one there doesn't mean uh, that there's no, can be no sharing of rule or multiplicity in that sense, right? It's the one true God. It's picking up that, and Scripture is very clear that Father, Son, and Spirit are the one true God, right? Yet, as the New Testament, indeed the Old Testament unfolds this, the Shema of Israel begins to take on expansion. It's already going on in the Old Testament. The Son of God, who's human, is so identified with the Lord that He has the names of God, He does the works of God, He does the rule, brings the rule of God, and so on, so that the oneness of God now also must be two-ness, right? Father, Son, and three in terms of spirit. Father, Son, and Spirit. 1 Corinthians 8, finished with this, is Paul reflecting upon this, isn't he? Paul's reflecting on this as he takes Deuteronomy 6 and now applies it in light of Christ, right? But the Old Testament storyline was already anticipating this. So he says, for even, right, so we'll look at um, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 5, for even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one one God, right? So the same affirmation of Deuteronomy 6. Who is this one God? The Father, from whom all things came, right? So he identifies him as the Father who is creator and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, right? The language of Lord We'll see is picking up Yahweh's name, gets applied in the New Testament. So you have God the Father and the Lord, Jesus Christ. There is but one Lord, Jesus Christ. And then notice, same work. Right? So it's not that the Father's creator and the Son something else. This, through the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things came. Creator, right? So the one God who is Father, Son, both creator, right? and through whom we live, right? And then we would add to this, which he doesn't hear, but we could, the Spirit, right? You could say, and the Holy Spirit, through whom all things came, and through whom we live, right? So here is, but where, where is Paul getting this from? This expansion, in some sense, of what it means for God to be one, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I would contend he's getting it, from a proper unfolding of the storyline of Scripture, right? That father-son relation gets tracked first in terms of the Lord, God, and the human. 
And then as you keep tracking it out, that human is larger than human. Right? Those are the hints that are found in the Old Testament. That's what Jesus brings to the, the religious leader's mind when he says, who is this Christ? Right? And this Christ is now the eternal Son of God who has become the Son of God. And by becoming the Son of God, I mean takes on our humanity, takes on our image in order to restore us, to keep, right, to undo what Adam did and, and so on. So that's the framework, I think, that Scripture speaks to us of who this Jesus is. And in some sense, right, if one works through the storyline of the Bible before you work through, I mean, you then come to the New Testament text that just simply expand on this proclaim this and, and, and uh, bring it uh, to, to greater light and so on, right? Uh, if you follow the storyline of Scripture and you say, who is this Messiah to come? You have to say, and the New Testament confirms this, he is the Son of God, right? But he is the Son of God who certainly is human, but he's more than human, right? He looks like God. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. So there's distinction between the two, father and son, yet there seems to be some kind of equality between the two, right? Yet he is human, right? In the New Testament, right? So you have that in kind of anticipatory form. In the New Testament, then the lights turn on, right? Ah, oh, this human son is the divine son. This human, one from David's line, conceived of a virgin by the Spirit, is that which is the eternal Son of God, the Word become flesh. Right? And so that's how the New Testament will lay that out. So this, this sort of laying out the framework here gives us the identity of who Jesus is. Right? I would say he is God the Son incarnate from the storyline. Right? And it also gives you something of his work. What's he going to do? Well, he's going to undo Adam. He's going to destroy sin and death. He's going to bring a new world. He's going to destroy all of God's enemies. He, I mean, all of these ways. He's going to reconcile us. He's going to bring blessing to the nations. He's going to fulfill the Abrahamic covenant. He's going to do all of these things. And that is then how the person and work of Christ are laid out from the Old Testament structures to New Testament fulfillment, right? And Jesus becomes, right, the central figure Right? It's not taking anything away from the Trinity, right? So it's obviously the Father through the Son by the Spirit, right? But this is Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, right? In the plan of God from eternity, this revelation of the Son heading all things up, right? Uh, sitting at receipt at right hand of the Father, putting all things under his feet, uh, having a people that he will have for eternity and so on, right? And so this is how the Bible, I think, works. This is how the storyline is Christological, Christocentric, right? Uh, this is how the types and shadows of the old, the promises of the old, reach their fulfillment in him, right? And this is the Jesus that we proclaim to the world, right? And who is this Jesus? He's no mere human. He is. He's no mere human, right? He is the Lord, right? So those are areas. So follow up. Um, we'll we'll take um, uh, you know quick break in that. But any questions just on some of that? Those are giving some sense Christology in terms of sort of the whole picture, right? So that when we have, and I would argue that when the church later on reflects on these things in terms of of um, the councils and creeds, right? So when they affirm that Jesus is truly God, truly human, all these areas, they're saying nothing different than what the Bible is actually saying, right? As the, as the scripture has laid these things out from old to new and so on, right? So questions just on, there's big structures. That's, that's the uh, shortened form of the whole Bible, right? Uh, centered in Christ, but I do think, right, you say, well, maybe some of this is old hat, but it's not to the people out in the world, right? It's, this isn't the Jesus they know, right? 
this is the one that we have to proclaim. This is the one that we say, this is who uh, faith in Christ is in. This is why his work is all you need, right? This is why salvation is found in him alone, right? Because this is how scripture presents him within the framework and categories and, um, and promise plan of God in scripture, right? So if you want to ask just on some of those items, now, do we hit some Adam Christology? Do we hit... Uh, a bit of wisdom, do we hit uh, Shema, I mean, some of those questions that were asked, if we didn't raise them again, but I tried to incorporate them as we uh, work through that particular uh, material. Right? Yeah, they didn't, uh, as far as we know, right, they had certainly a conception of the coming of Messiah. They didn't put all the passages together, right? So they had certainly the notion, Jesus shows that as he talks to the religious leaders. Who is Messiah, right? Well, he's David's son, right? So they clearly had a notion of king. There's going to come a Davidic king, a human king that's going to come and rule, right? So they clearly had that. There's also themes that we know from them that they had some priestly notion. They never seemed to combine everything in terms of prophet, priest, and king, right? And they certainly did not think uh, in terms of a divine uh, Messiah, Right? But the point is, does the Old Testament? Right? And I think the Old Testament does. Micah 5 2, right? Well, there you have a specific promise out of Bethlehem, which is clearly Davidic, right? So that's tied to the Davidic promise, right? Out of Bethlehem, a ruler will come who's going forth in some senses from eternity. So there's, yeah, we haven't looked at every text of the Old Testament, but I would say the Old Testament does. I mean, obviously, hindsight is 2020, and it's easier to see things in light of now the coming of Christ. But the Old Testament read properly gives to us the coming of a divine human Messiah. Right? Uh, one who is, uh, and, and this is how um, Christ's sonship is presented, his lordship is presented, right? He's so closely identified with the Lord that in having the names of God, the rule of God, bringing the work of God, you have to say he's equal with God. Yet there's clear distinction. Of course, this becomes the, the Trinitarian grounding. Right? So even in the Old Testament, you can say the Old Testament is laying out the one true God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right? Now, there was the question on the Theophanies, wasn't there? Right? The angel of the Lord and... Uh, they're difficult. I mean, I do think that we can make a strong case that, that somehow we have the appearing of, I mean, the theophanies are either God is now present in that form or particularly the Son of God, right? Yet we want to be very careful that it's not an incarnation, right? So it would be something that sort of like speaking through the cloud or speaking, taking on that form. It's not permanent. It's not the same as the word becoming flesh. That is permanent, right? He's taken a humanity, a human nature to himself that is now permanent, right? So there seems to be evidence, right? People dispute it. You either go is simply an angel that represents God, but it seems to be like Genesis 18 and so on that this one angels are distinguished. Two of the, of the visitors are angels, and the one clearly is identified as the Lord, right? So either God is revealing himself and not making differentiation between Father, Son, and Spirit, or you could say the Son of God, right? So either way. But that's not, I think, the primary way that the anticipation of the coming of Messiah, the Son, the deity of the Son is laid out. It's another hint that is, that is there. Any other any questions on, on that? Yeah, they, 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 they just... So within the Jewish community now, you have a whole range of Jews, right? So we're talking about those who actually believe <laughs> the Old Testament. I mean, you have a whole set of Jews that are just culturally Jewish, uh, and they're atheists and all kinds of things, right? Uh, but those who, are, those who are still looking for the Messiah, right? The Orthodox Jews, uh, they, are, they are taking this merely as Davidic king. And uh, they're not taking these passages this way. I think they're not wrestling with them. And you've got to remember, most of Judaism now, they still read the Old Testament, but most of it's given through the rabbis, through the interpretation 
of uh, Judaism that, f that, that really gets formed after the fall of the temple, right? So Judaism massively changes after Jerusalem, uh, 70 AD, because they can't, they can't carry out the Levitical system anymore. Uh, the records of the priests are gone. I mean, you couldn't, even, you couldn't even go back and find out who a Levitical priest is anymore, right? Because all those records were destroyed, the genealogical records and so on. So Judaism really changes quite a bit. So it appeals to the Old Testament, but it's also read through the rabbis and so on. So they are looking for uh, a messianic king, right? A human messianic king and uh, God's salvation through that king. But they're not identifying the king with the son of God, the eternal son of God in that way. All right, any other on, on that? Yeah. Romans 1, 3, 4? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a very important uh, text. It's been used in a number of ways. Um, so uh, I, I take, um, I mean, it's, it's interpretation that is, is tied back to uh, John Murray in his Romans commentary um, and, and uh, Tom Schreiner and, and Doug Mood, like the more contemporary. So as you, as you look at this, right, I mean, it's, it's laying out who this Son of God is, right? So Paul, a servant of Messiah Jesus called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures, concerning, regarding his son. Right? <clears throat> now, I think that phrase, regarding his son, is already assuming Paul is, is operating with, this is the eternal son. Right? So, the apostle Paul, plenty of places elsewhere, right, views the son of God as eternal. Right? So, so, this gospel promised before him, regarding this son, this son who's from eternity, and then he goes on to speak, though, of his, you know, coming human, right? His Christ Jesus, Messiahship. So regarding the Son, which is already saying he is the eternal Son, who as to his flesh, now a lot of our translations, uh, NIV has human nature, but I think flesh is the better. Uh, so who as regarding to his flesh was a descendant of David, right? So clearly there it's picking up, right? He comes from the Davidic line. He comes under that old era. I mean, I think that's the language of flesh. It's not saying that he's fallen or anything, but it's tied to uh, he comes in his humanity. He comes under the old era. He comes under uh, David. And who through the spirit of holiness was, and then the, the verb here um, often is declared, but I think it's best uh, is appointed. Right? The, the translation of it is best appointed. Now, the reason why people have avoided the appointment is because they're afraid that this would be adoptionism, right? So if he's appointed son by resurrection, then maybe he wasn't that before. That's the concern, right? But the phrase regarding his son, Paul's not thinking that, right? So he's taking the regarding his son as eternal son, yet this appointment through the spirit of holiness. So you have a flesh spirit kind of contrast, right? So through the spirit of holiness, he is appointed with power to be the son of God by the resurrection of the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So the emphasis here is, I think, on the Bible storyline, right? The work of the son. So the son of God, the eternal son of God, in order to um, bring about our salvation, must become human. And in that sense become the Son of God, right? Becoming the Son of God is not tied to his eternal deity. It's tied to his becoming human, right? So all the language of seed, son, Adam, Israel, David, and so on, he becomes the Son of God, and he becomes the Son of God through incarnation, through the line of David, and by his work, which is brought about by resurrection, but of course it's life, death, resurrection, brought about by the Spirit of God, right? So it's speaking of his appointment in light of his work tied uniquely to the resurrection, right? And it's the same emphasis that you have over and over again, right? It's the Philippians 2 emphasis. So in Philippians 2, you look at verse 9, right? So you have this one who is eternally God, right? So Philippians 2, 6, who being in very nature, or the word here is form, nature I think is a good translation, who being in very nature God, which already speaks of his deity, 
right? Made himself nothing, right? That's the emptying. By what? By taking. By taking the nature of a servant, made in human likeness, found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself even to death on a cross, right? So here is the eternal son now becomes human, becomes the son of God in the human sense, right? And he always obeys all the way to the cross. Therefore, God here, God, the subject of the verbs is the father, right? The father exalts him to the highest place, gives him a name that's above every name, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, and he's given the name Lord, right? Now, is this, I mean, does this contradict his eternal lordship? No. It's speaking of his work, right? So the eternal Son, who is Lord, Lord with the Father and the Spirit, Creator, Sovereign, so on. Now, in assuming our humanity, becoming human, goes to a cross, humiliation, and thus exalted. And in his exaltation, he becomes Lord the second time. <laughs> so this is where you have this sense of becoming Lord twice. He's the Son of God twice in that sense. He's the eternal Son who becomes the human Son. He's the Lord in terms of his trying relation with Father, Son, and Spirit, yet he becomes Lord in his incarnate work. Right? And so then he is appointed. So now he owns the universe twice. Right? Colossians 1 will say the same thing in Colossians 1, 15 through 20, right? Who is the very image of God, firstborn over all creation, because he's created all things, rules over all things, and then tied to his work, right? He is the one who brings the new creation. And the Great Commission is saying the same thing as well. So you think of Matthew 28, right? Where um, this has stumped people, but I think if we tie it to the storyline of Scripture, uh, there's no problem here. It's tied to his work, right? So Jesus then stands at the mount, and he says in verse 18, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And you start saying, what do you mean given to you? I mean, you're the eternal son of God. You already have all authority. Now, some will take authority being given to them. This is Wayne Grudem's view, is that he'll take this authority being given as eternal subordination of the son. Right? But the problem is this text is dealing with the work of Christ. Right? So what he's saying here, all authority in heaven has been given to me in the sense of as a result of my resurrection. Right? As a result, it's the same thing Romans 1 is saying. Right? By the spirit of holiness, by the work of the spirit, by the resurrection, he is now declared to be son. Right? So that's incarnational sonship in that sense. Right? So he now has all authority. So he had all authority as creator and Lord. And now he has all authority, so he has all authority by right. And now he has all authority by virtue of all that he's done, right? So he owns everything twice, right? The same way in our redemption, right? He owns us twice, right? He owns us first as our creator, and then he owns us as our redeemer, right? And so all things have been put under his feet, and all that putting under his feet is tied to his work as last Adam as the incarnate Son, uh, winning all things, destroying sin and death, bringing all this about. So that's what I think these texts are dealing with. So this is, this is how, um, you know, I, let's see here, how I often try to uh, describe it, right? And we will pick this up in other areas. So Jesus is, uh, is the Son. So yeah, I have here Son, sort of who... Uh, becomes, right, the Son, right? So, so, that, so that, that, you know, you have that in Scripture, right? So who is Jesus? He's the eternal Son of God, who now in his humanity becomes the Son of God. He's the eternal image of God, right, as the image of the Father, fully God, yet he is the one who takes on our image, right? He is the one who is eternally Lord, yet in his incarnation and work, he becomes Lord by virtue of all that he has done for us, right? That runs through so much of the New Testament. And where is it coming from? It's coming from the entire storyline of the Bible, right? Is that this seed of the woman who's human must be more than human, right? And that's how these things are, are laid out, right? Okay, any other questions on some of those those uh, points that's trying to give some sense of how 
the storyline is giving us Christology, right? Giving us both, in some sense, the, the person and work of Christ. Yeah. The language of persons, right? So, again, we'll pick this up a bit more as we move to historical formulation, right? So, the first thing is that we have to ask what the church meant by it on their own terms, right? So, what was meant historically by these terms, not what we mean in a contemporary way, right? So the way we use person in terms of contemporary usage is not the theological usage. So that's where we get a lot of confusion here, right? So when we use the term person today, I think we use it in at least three different ways. None of them are proper in terms of Trinity, Christology, and so on, right? So when we use the word person, we could say, you could point to someone and you could say, you, know, you see somebody walking and you say, who is that person? And you point to them, right? You're using person there to refer to an individual, right? Who is that individual? Who is that man? Who is that woman? Who is that person, right? That's one way we're doing it. That's not how we're using it theologically. We don't mean Father, Son, and Spirit are all three different individuals, right? That would move towards three different gods, right? <coughs> The other way we use person uh, is when we refer to, sometimes, especially in Christian circles, we often equate one's soul with a person, right? So we even have, I'm a, I'm a soul counselor, right? Or I'm a, I, I, I evangelism used to say we win souls, we win persons, right? I mean, we start using interchangeably the concept of soul and person, that clearly is not what's going on in terms of Trinity. Christology especially, because in the Chalcedonian Creed, there's a clear distinction between the person and the body and soul, right? So there's, there's you know, that use of it is, is not going to work. And then sometimes we use person to refer to a person's personality, right? We say, what kind of person are they? Uh, what kind of personality do they have, right? Well, none of those are theological use. So, your question, <laughs> what, what is a person, right? And this is not an easy issue to, to you know, get, get at type of thing, right? So, the best way I would say is what the church is saying in terms of summarizing is the persons, right, are Father, Son, and Spirit, right? So, they're moving first from biblical language. The Father is a person, the Son is a person, the Spirit is a person. There is now in, in Trinitarian thought, right, there is a person-nature distinction, right? And that is totally tied to Christianity, right? Um, Greeks, for instance, never distinguished person from nature, right? We know that for sure is because, and this was a controversy in the early church, when the church used Greek language to try to describe the Trinity, right? So the nature of God is referring to God's oneness, right? God is the one true God. The persons are referring to his threeness, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? The language that was used, so, so usia, right? And you also had uh, hypo stasis, right? So this is, this is Greek language that the church used. These two words, right, usia, will represent later on as, as the church uh, unfolds the doctrine of the Trinity, it will refer to the one being of God, right? So this is where we get the language of homoousius, right? The son is of the same being, same nature as the father, right? Hypostasis is the language that gives us the language of person, so the hypostatic union, right? In Greek, up until 362, right, these words were synonyms, right? So it creates all kinds of confusion, right? Because they were used interchangeably with one another, right? And the church had to distinguish them. Why did it distinguish them? Because the scripture teaches that there's one true God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? So we had to create vocabulary. So what's the person then? Person would be the subject 
of the nature. I mean, that's the best sort of way of getting at it. Definition of person ultimately would be a relation, right? A relation that subsists in the nature. That's the language that was used, a mode of subsistence, right? So the person is, I think the best way of saying it, is the subject of the nature. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God, but the Father is a subject in relation to the Son. They share the same identical nature, yet they are distinct by their personal relations, right? So person is being used there, not to load up into person what we normally do when we speak of an individual, right? Uh, we speak of a person as having an independent will, knowledge, action, and so on. That's not how the church used person, right? That's how it gets used today in terms of what's called social Trinitarianism or views that place will in each of the persons, right? So that the Father has an independent knowledge the Son has an independent will. The Father has an independent will. Each of the persons have independent wills, knowledges, and so on, right? That's not how person was used. Person was a subject of the nature. Persons are those who act in and through the nature, yet all of the attributes are tied to the nature, right? So the person has the sub. So the Father is, all right, is God because he has the fullness of the divine nature, right? He has the same eternity, will, knowledge, power, and I'm just walking through the attributes as the Son. The Son is God. He has the same identical nature as Father and Spirit, yet He is the subject of the nature as Son in relationship to the Father and Spirit and so on. So person is a pretty it's an important concept, but in person you don't have a mind. In person, you don't have a will, independent will. You don't have an independent knowledge, and so on. They are subject of the nature, but will, agency, mind, uh, knowledge, all is tied to what they share in common as the one true God, right? So person is limiting, right? So, so when you have the Son, right? The Father, Son, and Spirit have the same knowledge in their deity, Right? The Father, Son, and Spirit. So I'm thinking of Matthew 24, which is... So, Father, Son, and Spirit have the same knowledge, yet they have that knowledge in relation to each other. Right? So the Father has the knowledge of God as Father in relation to the Son, in relation to the Spirit. The Son has the same knowledge, but in relation to the Father as Son. Right? So there's distinction in terms of their relations, Father, Son, and Spirit, their persons, yet they have the same divine nature, right? That's how it's worked out in Trinity. Now, in Matthew 24, no one knows about the day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father, right? Because you have to then, I think, work from here is who is speaking, right? Well, it's the Son of God speaking, right? The person of the Son, as a result of the incarnation, has two natures, right? He is fully and truly God, and he continues to uh, share with the Father and Spirit that fullness of deity. That does not change. Right? Yet the person of the Son also has now taken to himself a human nature. What does that human nature have? It has a human mind. It has a human will. Right? It has a human body. I mean, a human soul. I mean, usually mind and will get tied to the soul. So there's human growth in knowledge in all of these areas. So you would have to say, and I think on the basis of this, you'd have to say the Son is speaking here as the Son of God in and through his humanity. Right? So that in that humanity, he does not have the fullness omniscience. In his deity, he does. But in the humanity, he doesn't. So he in his humanity... Uh, knows, right? So Luke 2.52, he grows in wisdom, stature, favor with God and man. That's his humanity, right? He does so, right, as we do, right? We have to learn things. He had to learn things. But he also has the fullness of the Spirit, 
right, in his humanity. So the fullness of revelation. So he's greater than any prophet. Prophets would have the revelation of the Spirit brought to them. He, in his humanity, would have the fullness of the revelation of God brought to him from the Father by the Spirit. Right? Yet that piece of revelation of uh, the end is not brought to him in terms of his human knowledge, in terms of his human mind. And I think that's how the church, for the most part, has tried to, uh, you know, think of these things in terms of uh, what he, the Son in terms of his deity, the Son in terms of his humanity, keeping together the fact that the person of the Son acts through both natures, but he doesn't turn his human nature into a divine nature. He doesn't make his human nature omniscient, right? In the human nature, he knows as a human his person, because there's no mind, will in the person. It's all through the nature. The subject of, of the Son, acting through the divine nature, continues to know as God with the Father and Spirit. Acting through the human nature, he knows as human. Right? And that's how the church is sought to understand that. But it requires right, that we be very careful with the language of person, that we don't treat it as we do in common usage, that we're thinking of three individuals here, individual knowledge, mind, will, agency, and so on. That is moving in the wrong direction. That would really move towards, if you're not careful, three gods. Right? So that's, I mean, these, these are very difficult areas, right? Um, we'll come back and unpack them a bit more, but that's just, you know, a quick uh, answer. <laughs>